season of Advent. The season where we look forward to celebrating Jesus' birth, and we look forward in anticipation to Jesus' victorious return. It's a season that we have filled with a great many other expectations as well. Christmas sales to be sought out. Christmas cards to be filled and sent. Gifts to be considered and purchased and wrapped. Delivered. Oh, extended family to be visited, dinners to be had, travel over the river and through the woods, even though not with slaves. <laughs> special services, TV specials, Santa and all the holly jolly business. Oh, it's all there. And sometimes we can feel that it's caught us up unexpectedly. We say, it's Advent season already? It's December now? You know? It feels like a trap, like verses 34 and 35 say. Sometimes, and I am going to date myself now, and do this periodically, sometimes it leaves us feeling a little bit like Chief Inspector Dreyfus from the Pink Panther movies. Now, the man starts as a pure professional, but after a while, dealing with the bumbling Inspector Clouseau, his eye starts to twitch. Then he starts to giggle madly, and it goes downhill from there. Sometimes we feel like we have become Chief Inspector Dreyfus when we face all of that. But Jesus gives us a peek into the future, and he instructs us in what to do so we don't end up in that poor condition. We are to be bold, we are to be watchful, and we are to have hope, as we'll soon see. The signs of Christmas are coming. Church decorating will be underway this Saturday. Advent readings and teachings are here. Candle lighting and candlelight services are coming. Christmas Eve service, not to mention everything we just discussed on the secular side. These are sure signs, just as sure as the signs of Jesus' eventual return, which will be broadcast all over the world in the heavens and on earth. It will be distressing and confusing to the nations when it comes. Just as the news that a king had been born in Israel was equally distressing to an insecure king named Herod. Well, some will be so terrified by the signs they will faint dead away. But Jesus guides us into taking a different approach to all of this. He says now, I don't want you to be confused, and I don't want you to be afraid. I am telling you instead that I want you to stand up. And I want you to raise your heads, because your salvation is near. This is good news. Rescue from misery and mortality and meaningless suffering is on the way. Those with faith will see these signs differently from the terror that others will see, it, will see them as. They will not see them as a threat. But they will be signs of joy, reasons for strong faith, soaring hearts, and ready hands. It's a great way to see the end of season's busyness as well. Along with the second coming. You can fear it, or you can make ready. There's no need for twitching eyes, nervous giggles, and a decline in demands. Jesus came into history in a major to a teenage father and a carpenter dead, and changed history forever. Jesus guides us now and forever. We are in God's hands. Jesus is our Emmanuel, God with us. All sorts of disasters will come, yes. Not just at the second coming, but now. We're assured of this. We know this will happen, but we are to stand up. We are to raise our heads. We are to face the future, not denying the challenges ahead, or the setbacks, or the heartbreak, or all the rest that we're currently going through or will, that will happen. But instead, because we know that God and Jesus came to pull us away from death and destruction and into life eternal, 
Like with God here and now and in eternity, we stand. We raise our hands. Jesus calls us to a faith of love and hope, justice, mercy, action. None of which is possible if we are cowering in a corner somewhere or have fainted dead away. But only if we are on our feet. Only if our heads are up. Only if we are confident in the future that Jesus has shown us. We are called to speak up. We are called to show the ways of hope to others. We are to point to Jesus so others don't need to be afraid. Right now I read an article that says six out of ten Christians won't speak about their faith because they're afraid. They're afraid that they will love cause tension or offense. But when we're afraid, when we have our heads bowed, when we crouch fearfully in response, we miss so much. <clears throat> we miss the glad discovery of lives that we can impact for the better when we speak of what Jesus has done in our lives to others. When we Miss connections we could have made. When we miss, we miss the glad discoveries and common experiences we share with people we didn't know we shared them. Doesn't happen if you're silent. We are called to act in the face of destructive forces, both natural and human made earthquakes, fires, whatever might happen. Jesus calls us to continue the work of discipleship boldly to the very end. If anything crushes fear, it's rolling up your sleeves and getting to work. And perspective helps. Seeing the joy in the future that Jesus has given us a glimpse of. Experiencing joy that endures even in hardship when we work. Seeing signs that are hopeful instead of fearful. That perspective helps. While we're being bold, we must also be watchful, carefully observant. The signs of the end are as sure as the first signs of Christmas in the sales ads and the Christmas carols on the radio. But we must have faith that Jesus' peek into the future is correct, that Jesus truly is our faithful witness. And he calls us to be watchful as well. He says, I don't want you to jump the gun. I don't want you to assume just because things are bad tomorrow that the end is here. It doesn't work. He says, I don't want you to draw false conclusions because if you do, you'll be lured down a path into believing that everything is constantly falling apart, that everything is constantly getting worse, and you will fall into helplessness. You will stop moving forward. Don't be convinced that every negative social, cultural, economic, political, or personal setback is a sure sign of the end. Your flat tire is not. Don't fall into pessimism. Don't let your hope drift away. Don't become what's termed this generation which was not meant to be a 40-year period, but just a way to describe a people a people who have succumbed to fear, who have become so anxious that they have become violent in their fear. They have been carried away by the excesses of the world. They have been defeated and hopeless and terrified and inert. We see them this miserable lot all through history. Don't be like this generation. It's not for us. We are called by Jesus to see past the false signs the distractions, and to observe carefully the beauty of creation all around us, the wonder and awe of all that God and his love has given to us, to thrill in the connection with others, with humanity, with all of creation, the animals and the birds and fish, to be awed and in wonder of it all. I walk regularly on a trail near our house because I need to. And I keep my eyes open and I try to view the world through that lens of faith as Jesus calls us to do. 
And it's the same path. It's the same distance. It's a mile and a half one way and a mile and a half back. You think it would be the same, but it's not. Every time I see something new. Every time. As the leaves fall, new things are exposed. And I see different wildlife. It is awesome to have a hawk fly straight up the trail at you and then dodge into the trees right before getting to you. It's comical to watch the difference between squirrels who just saunter across the path, don't care about you, and chipmunks who look like they're late for a business meeting, always <laughs> running wherever they're going. It's wonderful to do it. So be bold, be watchful, and one more thing, be prepared, don't be distracted. It's easy to lose sight of all that needs to be done in the Advent season when it hits us, when we feel trapped by it. All those things that we have to get finished. And we can get depressed. Our hearts are weighed down by the huge demands on us, but be prepared to face them. Make your lists, get your sleep. Approach these things methodically. It's the same with the world awaiting the return of Jesus. Don't let the worries of the world, the reports of disasters, the crimes, the human hijinks that are always going on depress and drive you to drink or drugs or distraction. They say these past few years that our length of life is going down. And it's going down for the first time since World War I because people are depressed. They have fallen under the weight of all that fear. And they're living shorter lives because of it. God, we have to remember that God hasn't forgotten us. God loves humanity. God loves us too much to ever abandon us, even when events around us suggest otherwise. Always remember the world remains in love, God's loving embrace, and so do we. God doesn't abandon us. God will always be with us. And since Jesus says he will return soon, but we'll never know the time. We need to sharpen our game. Our efforts need to be emboldened. We need to be ready. In faith, we follow Jesus with hope. We view the world hopefully. We work toward hope for ourselves and for humanity. We encourage others, and we encourage ourselves. We're swept up by this peak into the future with hope. And we live accordingly in the here and now. Jesus kept busy, waiting on God and fulfilling God's per plan. And so too we are called to be busy awaiting Jesus. Jesus is with us in our waiting. Jesus is with us in our work, in our sharing of challenges. Jesus offers us strength and hope to the end of the age. In the midst of the mayhem, the division, the disaster, we need to keep our heads up. We need to pray for strength. Prayer is always vital. We need to be bold and watchful and hopeful. But how do we express it? How do we put a point to our busyness? We take small steps. And we look for the evidence that small steps make just a tiny bit of difference in a dark world. There are things we can do. We can introduce someone to Christ by telling them our story of what Jesus has done for us. We can speak out against injustice in our small corner of the world. We can be willing to talk about hard issues. And when you're willing to talk about those, you spend more time listening than talking. You listen to the other person. We provide broad shoulders to cry. I just heard of a group from, I think it was, it's either Kentucky or Tennessee, coal miners, who got together with Massachusetts liberals. And they met and they discussed things. They wanted to know their differences between conservative and liberal. And one of them said the most startling thing. He said the second meeting would then take place in their home rather than up in Massachusetts. And he said, we were afraid when we went up. We were afraid they'd be cruel to us. But the second time, when they were coming down, we were excited that they would be there because now we love them. 
we found out how much we had in common. It's beautiful when you talk to each other, even about the hardest things. Be kind when people are scared. Show people that we can come together and help each other. Reach out to others when they fall into fearful isolation. And we tell stories of progress. We create new spaces for people to talk in. The live stream Bible study has done that for people who are busy working. They can meet for half an hour by a computer. Some of them are still in their cars and listening. Thank goodness not typing while they're, while they're listening, but still, we've created a new space. This is progress. This is exciting. We can all invite others to come here on a Sunday morning to hear the good news and to share in our warm and loving community. No need to keep this to ourselves. There are so many ways to be bold and watchful and hopeful. And whatever we're facing today, boldness and watchfulness and hopefulness will help us. Jesus loves us and will always have our backs. We've had our peek into the future, a future that will ultimately be joyous when it's seen with the eyes of faith. Let that joy infuse our Advent season and the rest of our lives. And now, as a way to free us from that fear, which often comes from spending too much time looking at screens instead of each other. I want you to enjoy a little of the beauty that God has given us. Turn towards a neighbor and say hello. Hello. Isn't that beautiful? Let's pause for a moment of silence. Amen. Luke 1.